Welcome everyone to our Contagion Cultures webinar. And uh, I, we're broadcasting from the traditional territory of the Ashinaabe and Haudenosaunee. And Queens was uh, inaugurated here on these lands in 1841 by Queen Victoria, which makes it both an institution of higher learning and also an imperial project. We're grateful to learn and work here and we need to remember this history. I hope that we strive for restitution for wrongs against indigenous and other people, wrongs that continue to this day. And I also hope that our series, which aims to incorporate and further various ways of thinking about how to best live with the planet, works in this direction. Contagion Cultures is a faculty of arts and science collaboration between the School of Policy Studies and Languages, Literatures and Cultures, with Queen's Library providing substantive support. The 50 minute talks are live streamed on Tuesdays at 4 p.m. Eastern, and we hope that you all pre-register, join us each week and help promote the series widely. The talks are available online and they'll be archived at the Queen's Library. We particularly hope that these original contributions by Queen's scholars will be deployed in courses in the future. Contagion Cultures Lectures helps make sense of this pandemic through the expertise and insights of arts and faculty, arts and science, faculty members. This public facing series leverages the powerful tools of humanistic analysis to grapple with our turbulent times. Uh, for the audience, you'll have at the Q&A button down at the bottom, you can hover and find it. You can type in questions for the Q&A afterward. And you're of course, as webinar attendees, invisible and muted. So we welcome your typed questions. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Lise Brin, who has been the program officer at the Canadian Association of Research Libraries for the last five years. Prior to that, Lise worked as an academic librarian at France, St. Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia. And Mark Swartz, who is seconded part-time to the Canadian Association of Research Libraries as a visiting program officer. And Mark is also our copyright manager here at Queen's University. We're so happy and grateful that they're taking the time out of they're scheduled to talk to us today for us to learn more about the about what libraries are doing and officially their talk is entitled libraries and COVID-19 how libraries are working to ensure optimal digital access during a pandemic something that all of the scholars and students uh, at the at all of the institutions um, of learning are just so grateful for so without further ado I, I hand it over to the two of them thank you Thank you very much, Jen. That was a great introduction. Um, so what we are hoping to do in this talk is to demonstrate how research libraries as a sector are pulling out all the stops to ensure that users have access to the information that they need whenever they need it. So this has included practical strategies put in place by libraries, but has also included advocacy in areas where change is needed. And as you will see, some of this advocacy has been driven by organizations like the organization that we're representing, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries and the Canadian Federation of Library Associations. But other examples have been grassroots campaigns organized by individual librarians and library staff. And then after we run through those things, we'll finish our presentation with some areas that we think are opportunities for libraries as we move forward into 2021. And as Jen mentioned, I've been the copyright manager at Queen's for nine years now, and I've been seconded to Carl part time for the past four years as a visiting program officer. And in that role, I've worked with the Carl Policy Committee very closely, um, primarily as it relates to advocacy around copyright and libraries. And uh, my name is Lise Brain, and I work with Carl as a program officer. For those of you unfamiliar with this organization, CARL is the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, and we are a strategy and advocacy organization that represents the 29 largest university research libraries in Canada, as well as two federal libraries. And personally, I work primarily with our high-level advancing research committee, uh, which in recent years has been focused on projects directly related to research and research collections, including open scholarship, digital preservation, institutional repositories, author rights, and open educational resources. So for academic libraries, the COVID pandemic has accelerated change that was already underway and exacerbated issues related to remote access to library holdings that existed well before the move to remote instruction. 
Nevertheless, I guess you could say that libraries were luckier than some in that we have been delivering digital content to users for decades now. We have systems and workflows in place to allow for this. For example, we purchased licenses for electronic journals, for ebooks, for data sets, and many other types of resources. We digitize and make available online archival collections. We support the production of electronic journals and open educational resources. We offer virtual reference help to our users uh, in many of our institutions. And we have been doing all of this collaboratively via regional and national consortia for many years. Certainly, there's been some transitions that have been difficult. Uh, certainly, some individuals' tasks, uh, daily tasks, were utterly dependent on contact with the physical collections. And so these had to be revisited and uh, they had to be um, assigned new tasks. But in terms of delivering material digitally, much of what libraries were being asked to do in recent months was to expand existing digital access. So that means increased spending on ebooks, on streaming video, and on other digital content. I will say that in a time when library budgets are already extremely stretched, the main challenges in providing access to the learning materials required to support coursework have been in doing so quickly, affordably, and equitably. So how did the pandemic really impact library access? Well, I would say there is there has been some variation across institutions. Not all have been affected in the same ways, depending on their internal practices and the community they serve. Not all have adopted exactly the same processes and approaches, but certainly the points you see on screen, I would say have generally been felt everywhere. Initially, I believe all libraries stopped offering physical access to print collections. And then gradually, slowly, processes have been set up to offer at least some access to print. It also became clear very quickly that many course readings or other types of works required for instruction were not available in digital form through library collections, or if these were available, that access was often restricted. For example, if you had a certain ebook um, that had been assigned as a print book beforehand, um, and suddenly you find, found yourself trying to uh, get 100 students in a class to allow one ebook, but that only had a one or two simultaneous user license, um, that could cause problems. Nevertheless, academic libraries have been and continue to be committed to serving the needs of our users. And uh, we needed to ensure students, instructors, and researchers could all continue their work. So that's what we've been putting practices in place to make that happen. Uh, in most institutions, some of the library services in many, and in many, many of the library services have not returned yet. And since a fair number of staff continue to work remotely and physical distancing is required throughout it's really unknown when libraries will be able to offer these services again. So how are we responding? Well, we are implementing solutions that will work for our users, we hope, and some of these we will outline in this presentation. We are trying to keep in mind all of our users, faculty, students, those with print disabilities, those with bandwidth issues, uh, those who were already struggling financially beforehand, before COVID hit, and who are now having an even harder time. We're also leveraging existing partnerships and collaborations. As we usually do, libraries have all absolutely been helping one another, sharing lessons learned, supporting each other with ideas and uh, best practices. We've of course had to stay on top of recommendations for safe handling of physical materials. And this is not easy when the, the, these recommendations change frequently based on available scientific knowledge and we're still not totally certain about what is safe. Um, though we're pretty sure we're maybe going above and beyond, if, if anything, which is not a bad thing at this point. And we've had to make some difficult decisions about limiting contact with resources that we know our users really want and need. Libraries and library associations have all, also been advocating for change at both the national and local levels, and that you'll be hearing about very shortly. Finally, we've been helping faculty understand what they can safely share with students while respecting copyright, as Mark can tell you. But first, we'll start with advocacy and we'll look at what um, libraries and library associations have been doing throughout the pandemic. 
uh, with Carl, we frequently take the lead on advocacy issues affecting Canadian research libraries and academic libraries generally. The majority of our work in advocacy at Carl is usually directed at federal government or its agencies and departments. And that's usually through responses to consultations regarding legal changes such as copyright or uh, through emerging and evolving questions. For example, privacy, broadband, open scholarship. So back in March, when institutions very suddenly shifted to online instruction as the primary means of uh, education or of instruction, librarians and staff at individual institutions started reaching out to publishers and vendors that they already had deals with. And at that point, they were asking for special consideration to ensure that students and faculty who really needed access to resources for their courses, who likely had had access to print resources, um, as well as uh, our digital collections, they suddenly needed all digital access. So uh, librarians started asking if those publishers would um, expand or um, expand the access or remove certain restrictions. These requests were often greeted favorably, thankfully, uh, but these took a lot of time. And this was at a point where every, the need was very urgent because there were only a few weeks of, course, of classes left. So a variety of library groups released statements urging publishers to loosen access restrictions and open up content more widely. The one we see here on the screen is from the International Coalition of Library Consortia, or ICULC. Similarly, Carl also issued one. Uh, ours was a slightly different flavor, I guess. Uh, we called it Carl's Statement on Optimal Equitable Access to Post-Secondary Learning Resources During COVID-19, and we released this in March. In the statement, we pose a few questions, for example, how can those of us serving instructors and students best respond to the new exigencies imposed by COVID-19? And what would be the optimal equitable access scenario? So included in the statement are recommended actions for publishers, for providers of video resources, for course instructors, for libraries, and for university administrators. So all these efforts by libraries and library associations were in many cases successful in the short term, which we were very pleased with. Um, for the conclusion of the winter 2020 term, we did, we were able to get access to uh, many more collections than had been previously open and available. However, however we, uh, in many cases, this access did not extend to fall 2020, which we kind of expected. Um, the emergency access that publishers were granting was really on two separate fronts, uh, and we have both here represented. On the left, we see a post from Publishing Perspectives, uh, which outlines how scholarly publishers were making and are making uh, COVID-related content free to use by all. And then on the right, we see an announcement by Pearson Canada announcing that they were loosening restrictions around their learning content. So in terms of that scholarly research related to COVID, many publishers made pledges that all the articles they published, uh, in some cases data that would be related to COVID would be free to access in order to benefit global research. This slide is of a statement by a UK based funder Wellcome Trust. And uh, it's the sharing research data and findings relevant to the novel, novel coronavirus COVID-19 outbreak. And so there were many, many signatories who agreed to make their COVID related research temporarily free to access. And certainly some Canadian funders, one research center, and at least one publisher in Canada agreed to sign on. Many publishers created special dedicated sites where their COVID research could be accessed free of charge. And that because they wanted to make sure there wouldn't be any confusion of, because of the paywall that would, of course, block access to the rest of their collection to, for, their, for most users. And interestingly, I think, uh, publishers generally did not use the term open access, which of course is associated with long-term um, permanent free access, uh, unrestricted free access to, to uh, 
research publications. Um, and I, I suspect they did that, no doubt knowing that the case for open access was being made via COVID, whether they wanted or not. So this is a list, a spreadsheet that we put together by the association iCulc with contributions from the library community. And it has 108 entries of publishers who responded to COVID with some sort of accommodation. So as I said, we were really glad to see that. There are a few Canadians on this list, for example, Canadian Science Publishing, Pearson Canada, and Canadian Electronic Library, all of which uh, offered some form of expanded access in, in light of COVID. Um, of course, we were rightly concerned that these changes in access would only be for the winter term. Some of these did not extend to the fall term, and uh, we've had to come up with other strategies to access, access content. Uh, libraries can also be a bit loath to widely uh, advertise content that is only briefly available for free. Uh, the reason for that is that sometimes it can be available and accessed through the library's catalog and a faculty member may assign it as a reading on a course and then find the following year that suddenly it's no longer available for the following instance of that class. And uh, that's something we really try to avoid, uh, putting the faculty and the students in that situation. So in conjunction with that statement, uh, I showed you the CARL statement on optimal access that we saw. CARL also developed some model text for libraries to use related to making works available to their students in their online instruction. Um, this was a statement developed with the help of many copyright librarians across the country and it's a practical guide for applying copyright to the use of works in remote instruction, which was also very appreciated. Every institution at this point was struggling with what kind of wording to release to faculty, uh, to instructors, and so having some model text available that they could reuse and adapt to their needs was really appreciated. Uh, this guidance applies to copyright exceptions and fair dealing policies that are in place to help facilitate remote instruction. And since we needed to develop that text quite quickly and for it to serve all institutions, uh, really it doesn't push the envelope or change our approach to fair dealing and other copyright exceptions in light of the pandemic. However, there are certainly some legal experts who have advocated for a much more liberal approach to fair dealing in light of this situation. So as Lee's mentioned, um... The CARL guide was a quick resource for those looking to move courses online using existing fair dealing policies and other copyright exceptions. But at the same time, there was a move afoot to reconsider our approach to copyright, specifically our approach to the fair dealing exception in the Copyright Act. And I know that many of you are probably familiar with what fair dealing is, but if you're not, it's an exception to copyright, meaning that you can use this exception to make use of copyrighted works without permission or payment to a copyright holder. So it's a two-part test that you have to pass. First, your dealing must fall under one of the listed purposes in the Copyright Act, so they include things like education, research, and private study. And secondly, your dealing must be fair. And there's a fairness test that is in the landmark case, CCH and Law Society of Upper Canada. So in the post-secondary sector, most institutions have adopted policies that establish a 10% rule for determining fairness, meaning you can, for example, copy and make available to students around 10% of a book or one chapter, whichever is greater without permission or payment. But in our new remote learning, uh, online learning environment, some have flagged this approach as one that requires a rethink. For example, um, the, this example on this slide is a campaign that was started in the US from a variety of library copyright specialists related to fair use and emergency remote teaching. And this statement advocates for expanding the use of fair use, which is the US exception that is similar but is a bit more flexible than our fair dealing exception. And this statement got a lot of, um, it, it was spread around by a lot of people. It had 51 signatories and over 200 endorsers. And it essentially argues that it is evident that making materials available and accessible to students in the time of crisis will almost always be a fair use. And that courts favor uses where the purpose is to benefit the public and courts favor educational uses because of their broad public benefit. It did include some ways to mitigate potential risks of things like restricting, restricting access to those in courses using materials and giving access um, for a limited amount of time. 
And after that statement was released, these types of statements started to appear in Canada. First with a statement by Sam Trusso, a professor from the law school and the library school at Western and Lisa Macklem, uh, one of his graduate students. And then uh, this was followed by a statement by the Canadian Federation of Library Associations Copyright Committee. And both of these statements go through the six factors for determining fairness that I mentioned earlier in a fair dealing analysis and make the case that the pandemic and the shift to remote teaching, learning and research justifies a broader use of fair dealing than the policies in place at institutions before the pandemic. Um, and this is another uh, example of an appeal to loosen copyright. And this one comes out of the organization called the Creative Commons. Uh, finally, there was also an interesting statement issued by the Film Studies Association of Canada calling for a broader use of copyright exceptions to enable online screenings for film schools. So um, film online screenings have been a major issue for film departments across the country. Um, so the, the, film, the professors in the film departments were looking for a solution to be able to enable their online screenings. But publishers and publisher groups have not stayed silent on this front. Publishers are generally opposed to the use of exceptions and limitations to copyright like fair dealing. And they had a strong reaction to the ICALC statement and the Carl statement that, 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 that they said both supports the broad use of copyright exceptions. So the Association of Canadian Publishers sent a letter to Carl and CFLA and a number of MPs and officials in Ottawa outlining their concerns, stating that they feel like broadening exceptions and limitations would have a major impact on publishers as they try to recover from this unprecedented global crisis. So when we got this letter, we ended up, so Carl and CFLA ended up sending a joint letter back um, stating that both the ICALC and the Carl statements did not advocate for any, to broaden any exceptions and limitations. And that exceptions and limitations or user rights as they are known are just one of many legitimate strategies being used to provide access to works. And that libraries are actively engaged with supporting publishers and increasing purchases for digital works as well. But one thing that we did not raise in our letter back to publishers are the many challenges that libraries are facing when trying to purchase digital works, particularly in the case of textbooks. Digital purchasing is very different than what libraries experience in the print environment, as publishers have much more control over the products that they make available to libraries, if they make them available at all. And now that borrowing a print copy of a book or a textbook from a library is no longer an option for most students that are engaged in remote learning, the lack of availability of digital copies is becoming a major, major issue. And this issue was amplified over the summer when a group of librarians at Guelph issued a statement that called out the major textbook publishers for not selling to libraries. You can see that, they, that one of the things that they demonstrated is that 85% of existing course textbooks are simply unavailable to libraries in any other format other than print. And this statement hit a nerve and it, it went global. It, it was talked about all over the US, all over, all over the world. And it ended up being adopted by more than 100 university libraries and organizations, uh, which is incredibly impressive. So at Carl, we've been working on a similar statement that we are hoping to be released this week. And it highlights many of the issues surrounding both purchasing e-textbooks and e-books and libraries. And this statement started life as an open letter posted on Twitter by Meg Ecclestone, a collections librarian from Guelph. And we've been working really closely with the Guelph, University of Guelph library staff, including Ali Versluis and Heather Martin to craft a new statement. So uh, some of the issues that we've identified and that I, I, I have mentioned is that many eBooks and most e-textbooks are simply not available for purchase by libraries. E-textbook publishers are increasingly offering titles solely through highly restrictive models geared directly towards students. So the, in, these, in this model, e-textbooks are sold to or more accurately rented to students through third-party companies that provide the content only to students who are registered for the class and only by semester. So if we can, if a library can even purchase an ebook, it is also typically much more expensive than the print version, and the price difference can vary significantly. An example that we use is a physical copy of a textbook required for a third year psychology course. So it costs $200 for the physical version of the text that we would put in the library. 
And then the ebook copy a version of a library for the library is priced at $1,500 for one year of access. And it only comes with a three user limit, meaning that only three users can access it at one time. And this is for a course of 450 students. That three user limit, so that, that you know, only three users can access it at one time or check it out, is an example of how publishers that do sell eBooks to libraries almost always lock them to platforms that limit how users can access and use the content. These limits create complications for reasonable use, particularly when they're being used by instruction and by students studying in a variety of locations with a range of connectivity issues. These technologies can also complicate making works available for individuals with perceptual disabilities. Another problem with the purchases, digital purchase in libraries is that access is not always perpetual, meaning that it doesn't always last forever, meaning that libraries may lose access if you know, we get a one or a two or a three year license and a publisher decides to stop selling that book to libraries after that license expires. And publishers may do that if they see a book being adopted by a course and they see possible sales. So this issue is similar to the issues that public libraries have been facing for years, where public libraries have been very limited in the electronic titles that they can purchase and lend. And um, the public libraries in Canada have been running a very successful campaign called eContent in Libraries. And I'd encourage you, if you're interested in this, to go take a look at their website as they use ex specific examples demonstrating price differences between what a consumer would pay and what a library has to pay. And some, you know, many times it's like three or four times more expensive what libraries have to pay. And it also enables patrons to write directly to publishers to re request access to titles and libraries. And our statement, which I mentioned will be out soon, is also adapted from a similar campaign run by a UK librarian, Joanna Anderson, that calls for regulation in the ebook market in the UK. So what are we asking for in the statement that we're putting out? Um, so we have a couple of categories in our call for action. And the first category in the call are things that we're already doing. Um, so with library, librarians and instructors working in partnership to improve accesses, access to resources. So the subject librarians and the library staff at Queens in areas like information services, reserves and open scholarship service are working hard to enable these alternatives. And they include things like identifying eBooks already in the library collection for use in course delivery, licensing eBooks that are not traditionally considered textbooks like academic eBooks and using those instead of textbooks that will, are not available in libraries, creating online course readings through course reserve services. So our, like our e-reserve service at Queens using existing library resources, working with campus bookstores to create digital course packs, are using, revising, or creating open educational resources, or OERs. So OERs are freely accessible educational materials that are openly licensed that, in a way that allows for reuse and modification by instructor. And at Queens, we've had an OER creation grant available through the library for a number of years, and we have a number of textbooks that are currently under development. At the same time, academic libraries also see a pressing need for innovation and community-led infrastructure in the publishing ecosystem and more academy-led initiatives, including encouraging the growth of and adoption of an increasing reliance on open, if openly available content, particularly open educational resources. And Lise will mention this as an opportunity a little bit later. Also exploring alternative models of making works available, such as controlled digital lending to provide materials in their print collection. And I'll go into what controlled digital lending is in a couple of slides as well. And supporting through library pur purchasing policies, publishers that have both library and student friendly practices and pricing. But the second category in our ebook statement was libraries working with publishers. And we're making the case there that more needs to be done. As courses have dramatically shifted to online learning, it's important that publishers develop digital access models that foster accessible, affordable, and inclusive environments that better support students. So measures that we would welcome there is allowing sales of ebooks and e-textbooks to libraries under licensing models that, um, that are allow for as much access as possible with a cost with a cost that fairly reflects the content. So with that should come predictable and consistent pricing and availability. 
And we also call for uh, no digital rights management. So none of, no con technological controls on the content or limited technological controls if it is necessary. So another area of advocacy that we've undertaken is in relation to Crown copyright. And Crown copyright is uh, the copyright uh, over any government works. So this is an area that Carl and CFLA, the Canadian Federation of Library Associations, have been undertaking for a number of years. Uh, we've been speaking with government about changes to Crown copyright, uh, and we've and that's primarily because we've been hearing from our government documents and digitization staff in libraries that many hi essential historical government published sources are simply unavailable to the public. And when we try to get permission to reproduce these and make these available uh, via our digital collections, it's often very difficult to obtain the proper permissions. Uh, there is lack of clarity in terms of what government documents are even covered by Canada's open government license. So that has complicated things substantially. Um, we, so when COVID came around and we were hearing government agencies calling for unfettered access to information related to COVID, we definitely saw this as an opportunity uh, to approach them again. And so we see here a letter that Carl and CFLA submitted to the Minister of Canadian Heritage, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, and also to the President of the Treasury Board, uh, since those are the three uh, ministries involved or departments involved in, um, in copyright. And so what we asked for is we said, we are calling on federal and provincial governments to make official publications more accessible to Canadians by assigning a Creative Commons attribution license to publicly available government information. We see this as a necessary and immediate response to COVID-19 and the appropriate default model for accessing, accessing government information. Uh, and just for clarity, the, uh, the CC BY license, the Creative Commons attribution license, is one of several um, licenses that have been created by Creative Commons that a creator can choose to apply to a work they've created, which conveys to the public what you can do with that work without needing to seek uh, permission. So it is a license that a creator chooses to apply to a work. And another detail is that we were asking for this to be retroactive, not just forward looking. So now we'll move on to some practical solutions that libraries have implemented. So, and many of these were put into place in order to deliver digital access whenever feasible. However, although the, la the focus of this talk is on digital access, uh, it's clear that it is impossible to replace all print and physical access in libraries with digital options. So I'll touch very quickly on a few things that libraries have been doing around print uh, collections. Since we heard very clearly from primarily humanities and social sciences that they really needed access to those print collections. Um, these are often not available elsewhere or they have images and other content that does not transfer well to rapid scanning or is not available in the digital copies that are available. Um, and so we developed strategies to allow for access. There's a number of different ones that have been adopted by libraries. Scan and deliver, where an, uh, a suitable portion of a work um, under copyright, so under fair dealing, can be scanned and delivered to a user directly. Um, curbside pickup, where patrons can wait outside and have the books they require be delivered directly to them there. And I know, for example, at York University, they've installed a large number of lockers where uh, you can pick up the books you've reserved in an individual locker, having been given a code to access that. And also some libraries have implemented some limited access to stacks, but certainly very controlled. I'll note that the image you're seeing on screen is the room in the uh, Queen's University Douglas Library that is affectionately dubbed the Harry Potter reading room. 
Um, and that's one area as well. So study rooms, there was a huge request for access to study rooms. We know that uh, many students lack reliable access to Wi-Fi and to quiet study spaces. So many libraries have now created um, booking systems for study rooms and for study spaces to ensure that students can know ahead of time whether there's a space for them before heading over. And finally, one area that's been really heavily affected by the pandemic, and Mark has touched on this, is print reserves. So we've talked about uh, the lack of availability of print textbooks or the inability of libraries to um, loan out short-term um, e uh, print textbooks to users because of the health directives that prevent libraries from loaning materials just for a few hours to a person than to another. Uh, we have to quarantine those physical objects between uses, unfortunately. Uh, so the whole issue of print reserves has been a really hard nut to crack. Some libraries are still offering limited print reserves, but most libraries have just foregone print reserves completely. And so this means for many students, no access to print textbooks, whether these were library purchased or instructor provided. And libraries have tried to establish alternative options, but as we've, as we've heard, that's been very difficult. And this unfortunately has had a negative effect on many students. As we know, an increasing number of students are unavailable to purchase their own copies of textbooks and uh, are often dependent on the library to access uh, a copy, or they usually would share a copy with other students. So this is an area that we've become much more uh, aware of and that we've had a really hard time solving. Um, in the case of Queens, I will mention that the library has recently established a reserve reading room for students in courses that are being offered on site, so only for those students. So uh, now to just touch on digital access to print collections. So libraries, including the library here at Queens, have been working really hard to meet instructor needs. And this has included incredible effort from our liaison librarians and our staff to meet needs through increased digital purchases, but also through the use of models that enable digital access to print works, like controlled digital lending and the Hathi Trust Emergency Access Program, and then the scan and deliver service that Lee's mentioned, which allows users to request scans of short exits of works in our physical collection, rather than checking the item out and picking it up through curbside delivery. So one key concept that is central to some of the services that are being offered is something called controlled digital lending. And controlled digital lending is a method to loan print books digitally where libraries mimic print lending in the digital realm. So this means that if a library is using controlled digital lending or CDL, they can loan one digital copy of a book as long as they have the print book in their collection. When the digital copy is being loaned, the print copy is taken out of circulation um, and is not available to library users. The library would also place technological controls on the digital version so that the number of digital copies checked out corresponds with the number of physical books in the collection. So this method of loaning print material digitally was in fairly limited use in Canada before the pandemic. But one place where it was in wide use was in an organization called the Internet Archive. Over the past number of years, the Internet Archive has been using controlled digital lending to make a vast library of works available digitally. Many of these books had been donated to the Internet Archive, digitized, and the print versions had been kept in their archive and didn't circulate while they were being loaned digitally through controlled digital lending. So when the pandemic hit, the Internet Archive broadened their approach to controlled digital lending and re removed that one-to-one -one requirement for loaning the digital works, meaning that anyone could now check out all of the works in the CDL emergency access collection at the, at, at the same time. And they argued that the expanded service was justified in light of the emergency access required during a pandemic and that this access was only for a limited time. Unfortunately, uh, the publishers didn't agree and this emergency access went too far for publishers who filed a lawsuit against the Internet Archive on June 1st for the mass scanning and distribution of work. 
it works. Um, this lawsuit, which is backed by five major publishers, continues. And for their part, the, the Internet Archive has been pushing back, but they did end up cutting off that emergency access early. So it was cut the emergency access where you could access, you know, uh, restriction free all of the stuff in the CDL collection was cut off on June 14th when it was supposed to continue until June 30th. So another similar service that is enabled at Queens and at about 100 other libraries in North America is the Hathi Trust Emergency Access Program. So Hathi Trust is a massive digital library that includes millions of scanned works contributed by partner libraries like Queens. So how the Emergency Access Program works is that it maps the library's print holdings onto the digital holdings in Hathi Trust. So for example, if the Queens University Library has a book in its collection, one copy of that book can be loaned out if it's available in Hathi Trust. And then the library would take that book out of circulation. In this context, it means that any of the books available in Hathi Trust are not available for our scan and deliver or curbside delivery service because our stacks are not available anyways. So the Hathi Trust copy is also very restricted using digital rights management and so that users have very limited copying, downloading and printing options. They can essentially just see, see the work. They can't do that much with it and read the work. So Hathi Trust is one, um, one way that we're enabling access, but other institutions are using comparable services and have built services around similar concepts. So for example, uh, Western University is partnering with the Ontario Consortium of University Libraries to offer a similar model to Hathi Trust using a combination of the OCL Ontario Consortium of University, University Libraries ebook platform and the ARIES e-reserve service um, to make a print course reserve reading, so make print course reserve, reserve readings of available digitally. So another, another area where there have been major issues that I mentioned earlier is with streaming video. And this year, there has been a major increase in streaming requests and streaming purchases. And uh, the libraries will generally purchase streaming rights when possible. But the fact is that many licenses are simply not available for purchase by libraries. So some institutions, either through their departments or libraries, have turned to a rarely used copyright exceptions to make these works available to students. Um, this is the distance education exception, and it hasn't been used in the past because it came with some really onerous restrictions in that it requires that individuals making copies of a work do so in a specific way in order to not break technical, technological measures, so not to break DRM and that the copies must be deleted when a course is completed by both instructors and students. But because of the pandemic, the universities have had to de develop services around this exceptions when they would not have done so in the past when in-class screenings were still available as an option. All right, I'll turn it over to Lise to talk about the opportunities. So in addition to all the challenges that we've been facing, um, I would say that there have also been a number of issues that have come to the forefront, and we've identified a number of opportunities um, related to the delivery of, of uh, online, primarily online courses by institutions. We're certainly becoming much more aware of how people are affected by access limitations, which is something that we didn't, weren't necessarily always aware of in uh, pre-COVID times. Um, so. We've also, I've already mentioned, we've seen uh, COVID as an opportunity to start advocating again for Crown copyright. Um, <clears throat> but related to all of this, I, there are two more op areas of opportunity that I would like to focus on. So the first is open access. So again, uh, open access is the practice of making scholarly publications openly available to all in a, an unrestricted format. So uh, you may have seen some of the headlines that I'm going to put up here for you uh, in recent months. So initially, I thought it was just libraries pushing this message. But from what I can tell, virtually every publication related to scholarly publishing and to scholarship has run a story like these ones. Um, and so clearly the, the global health crisis has demonstrated very clearly that immediate open access is the best route to solving large scale global problems. Publishers have admitted this by making all research related to um, 
uh, COVID available publicly, and funders have been pushing this idea. Uh, so it's a very small inference to go from that to realizing that openness, open access to scholarship is the best route for all forms of research, whether it's to better understand our, uh, rem how remote teaching is best undertaken or in regards to climate change. And then another area, sorry, I'm just gonna get rid of these kittens here. <laughs> another area I wanna draw attention to is open education and open educational resources. This is another area that's really come to light as an area of opportunity. Um, there's been a strong push by a number of organizations, including ours, uh, to consider OERs as primary uh, means of learning materials for, uh, for classes. Um, on screen now is the Carl Statement, where we encourage take up of open educational resources. And for those of you who may not be too familiar with OER, I know Mark's mentioned it earlier, but OER are free to use, openly licensed educational materials that have been produced by experts and educators in the field. And these can be textbooks, but also quizzes, lesson plans, or many other types of resources. Uh, what's interesting with OER is obviously there's no cost to the user unless they want a print copy. And usually those are produced at a very, very low cost. And since these materials, um, uh, right, and you can retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute an OER. Those are the five R's typically associated with um, OERs. So clearly there's a benefit um, in the situation that we're experiencing for educational content that is designed from the outset to be barrier free, to be reusable and adaptable by the instructor. And there's already a large amount of open educational resource, open educational content available for use. Um, considering the reports we've been hearing from students, like many Canadians, that have been experiencing even more financial stresses since March, and considering the inherent difficulties with providing equitable access to students via traditional textbooks, many librarians have been very active in encouraging instructors to at least have a look, or maybe a second look, at uh, what's out there as far as OERs in their discipline. And frankly, I think some of you might be surprised by all the new content and new formats that have become available just in the last five years or so. OER is really an area that has expanded. Um, institutions like Queens having grants available, that's had a major impact in the quantity and quality of uh, materials available. So, Ah, we reached the last slide. And so those were just some of the things that uh, academic libraries have been up to in the past seven months or so. There are actually quite a few other interesting things that we could have reported on. And just to quickly list off a few, uh, our digital archivists have been archiving all forms of web-based pub web publications and communications during this time, often at the local level. Um, some institutions have been doing 3D printing of PPEs, uh, so especially at the early, in the early times when there was a, a real lack or, or there weren't enough of these around. Um, they've been harnessing the power of libraries' computer banks for big data research. Uh, libraries certainly have been providing fully online library instruction on a variety of topics. They've been providing remote access to specialized software available on library computers that were no longer available to users. And they've been supporting faculty with the conversion of course content to the campus learning management system for those who weren't familiar with those processes. So I hope we've given you enough to chew on um, and we absolutely welcome any questions you might have. Thank you for that very informative talk. It really answered a lot of my questions about how um, how it is that I magically am able to get things that I need to read. Uh, and it turns out it's not magic. It's all uh, your hard work and lots and lots of lobbying and, and talking to the talking to people um, to convince them to do the right thing. Um, I wonder if I can ask um, a bit about uh, money uh, in terms of um, grants for from Queens for um, for open education software. I think it's a wonderful thing. And I wonder whether is it just trendy and are, can we be sure 
that if we're instructors, that there's there are going to be high quality educational materials available to us when we need to deploy them in order to teach. Because I myself, for example, am not tra formally trained in pedagogy. I have a different research agenda, and I don't have the ability to make high quality teaching resources uh, for myself. So I would need to be um, I need to have them um, be made by someone else, and usually it costs money to make stuff if it's if it's to be sustainable. A one-off is one thing, but grants can be kind of hard to to get, uh, and they might dry up. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that uh, the the driver behind a lot of the OERs that are being created are grants, and that a lot of the OERs are being created by instructors, by a faculty across, you know, ar around the world. Um, but as more institutions have granting programs, as more institutions are funding um, and more provinces, so BC has a fairly active um, granting program and as does Ontario and a few other provinces as well, um, the more OERs that we have to pick from. So it, the best way to get started with OERs if you want to adopt one rather than create your own is just to look around. So um, the in Ontario, the eCampus Ontario um, search engine or the their repository have a ton of OERs in them, as does the BC campus um, repository as well. So, I, I mean, that that's the strategy that I would give you. And if you are interested in developing your own OER, we will likely have future grants available in, in coming years. We the, the last one that we had where we funded some OERs was in April. I guess we'll uh, to put in a plug that you can also approach a librarian the library and they are usually very happy to help point you in the direction of uh, resources in your discipline because it, it can be absolutely a bit onerous to try looking for OERs on your own if you haven't done so before so having a helping hand is not a bad thing. Librarians are always uh, very very helpful and I'm very very grateful to librarians and I if I, I think a take-home message from what you both said is that you as professionals are not the, who are very involved in this topic are not very concerned with my concern. You don't think that my concern is really a real concern that I that in five or ten or fifteen years there's not going to be any good textbooks out there because we switched to open source learning that or uh, like open uh, open textbooks. Is that kind of what I'm hearing from you? And then I have questions in the. Q and A or one question that that I'd like to uh, read before, but I would I'm just taking my um, power as a moderator to ask you to answer that. I don't think we're anywhere near um, you know having textbooks disappear or the traditional textbooks disappear. I think at this point we are are an alternative. Um, so we still have lots of time before textbooks. Yes if they were to disappear did. And certainly a lot of instructors are moving away from textbooks anyway and assigning a variety of resources, yeah. which has become so much easier within the online realm. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for that. So I have a question from Shelby Stinnison, if I'm getting the name right. Co copyright literacy is needed for folks teaching and learning in the online environment. With typically zero to two designated copyright roles at an institution, are there any guidelines or best practices in the works from Carl for copyright education programs to train the trainer to expand programming in a responsible way? So uh, thank you so much for that question, Shelby. Um, it's, a, it's a great one. Uh, so at Carl, we are currently finishing development of an open copyright course. Um, and that is going to be targeted towards instructors and individuals and will be able to be rolled out on campuses. So that'll help individuals in those roles. But I'd also like to, uh, to throw a plug out there for the fantastic opening up copyright courses that have been developed out of the University of Alberta. And um, actually, Amanda Wakarek is on this call and I, on this webinar, so she can throw some more information in there if, if she wants. But they include an absolute wealth of information about all different copyright-related types of, 
of of questions and content and they can be an incredibly useful resource for people that are you know that are interested in this type of thing and one of the things that we've been talking about is a partnership between the opening up copyright courses and the carl courses to offer some kind of certi certificate that could possibly act as a train the trainer potentially for librarians or something like that um, but we're kind of in early stages of discussing what that could possibly look like. But uh, stay tuned; it 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 should be something that comes that, that comes to fruition over the next year or so. I was in the chat. I see information uh, about the ABC Copyright Conference Fall Speaker Series hosted on Zoom by the University of Alberta Copyright Office, which is tomorrow. Um, and with a link, but I don't know that I have the capacity to give that link to the uh, participants, um, but I'm sure that if you would Google Copyright Conference Fall Speaker Series at University of Alberta, the, uh, then you'll be able, you would be able to get involved and, and uh, learn more uh, from them. So do we, uh, do we have any last comments um, from Mark or Lise? because we're coming up right on uh, five o'clock. And if not, I would um, thank you, but let me see if you have last words of wisdom. I think just thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, well, so glad so many people could come at four o'clock on a Tuesday. It's, it's fantastic. And the chat is full of accolades and I, uh, I second that as well. And so really thank you both for your time and helping to educate us uh, about libraries and uh, information resources in this in this time of electronic delivery. So thanks again. Bye everyone. See you next week.